Uh, I'm very happy to be here, and it's not my first time in Rio. Actually, I'm uh, closely connected to uh, Brazil. Uh, I'm an honorary member of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, Israel-Brazil Chamber of Commerce, and uh, I have uh, some businesses in, uh, in Brazil as well. And, uh, but here I'm talking about a project which is really more for, uh, for benefit, and, uh, and you will see it. Uh, later, I'll introduce a, a kind of an application that we have been talking about, and uh, this will be, of course, distributed for free to anybody. It's not ready uh, yet, but uh, we shall... Uh, there are places where you can sign your name if you like to get it. It will be ready, I guess, between a month or two months from now, and we'll send it. Of course, it's free. All the system uh, will be uh, free, as I mentioned uh, later. So please, we shall pass the paper among you also. You can sign the, your name there. I'd like to start with the, uh, with the quotation from, that was published just uh, about two weeks ago. We are the first generation that has a clear picture of the value of nature and the enormous impact that we have on it. We may also be the last generation that can act in a reverse to this trend. I think this is really a good start for the conversation because how can we do things without education? Education is extremely important here, and uh, this is the step that we'll need. So that's natural. Okay, so let's talk about it. I gave uh, the lecture two titles, really. The, the major title is the industrial era. It's not the, the uh, people, it's a post-industrial era, because uh, in the industrial era, we put our, all the attention on it, uh, economic motivation. So countries uh, were trying to maximize the GDP. The uh, firms are trying to maximize their wealth or profit. And um, while doing that, which led to a tremendous eco economic growth over the last uh, two generations, uh, two uh, centuries at least, but on the other hand, uh, it left us with a dramatic exposure to immense environmental and uh, societal risks. Uh, these risks are really threatening our existence. And uh, it doesn't uh, threaten the existence of the world. Some people said we, at one of the breaks we were having a conversation, they said, well, it risks the, the, the Earth, planet Earth. No, planet Earth will continue beautifully well for the next, uh, I don't know, few billion years at least. And uh, whereas it will live much better without humanity. It will yeah, be relieved when we won't be here. So we better not let him enjoy <laughs> this uh, thing. We are connected to it. Most of you probably recognize this picture. Uh, how many people know, know this? This is a, a, a picture from the book of uh, Saint-Exupéry. Uh, he was a pilot, was killed in a crash in 1943, just a few months after he published the book. The book is named is The Little Prince. The Little Prince is living from on another planet, a small planet, and he went on a trip to visit the next uh, neighboring planets. One of them was the planet of the Lantern Lighter. Already in 43, many cities were already lighted by electricity, but still there were cities that were lit by light and li lighter lighter, uh, lanterns, lighters. That they went from at night, they went to, to light the poles, and in the morning, they had to extinguish it. And this guy is uh, complaining. He said, my job, I'm living 
on a small planet, there is only one lantern. I had a very easy job. In the evening, I had to put on the light. In the, in the morning, I had to turn it off. However, it started revolving really fast, and it's accelerating. And now, every second I have, or every minute I have, to turn it on and turn it off, turn it on and turn it off, and they didn't change the instructions. So it's a children's book, but it's really for adults. Because it was, all the visits that he had were showing all kinds of strange points in our environment. And he was envisaging a very fast development. And really what we are facing today is accelerated rate of change. I started my career in the early 60s. I was the first technological forecaster for Israel. And uh, I was teaching it also in, in, at the Hebrew University as part of my finance courses. I, I taught another course on long-term planning and technological forecasting. In those days, it was, a, was possible to forecast the future simply by extra, extra, extrapolating trends, more or less. Now we can't do it because of the disruptive technologies that come every every now and then, every week, and practically every day, there are new technologies. So, uh, so now we have to plan in a different way. We have to create the future. You can't forecast the future. I'm a direct descendant of Ewan, the, the brother of Moses, a dynasty for 3,000 years or more. And uh, but still, we are not prophets. <laughs> I cannot tell you what will happen in the future. We have to create a future. So how do you create a future? You have to create a vision. Once you create a vision, you have to go backward to see what are the obstacles that are preventing you from reaching this. Usually these are things that are related, that we relate to them as impossibilities. So we look for ways to do the impossible things and then we find that in order to do them, we have other difficulties. And that way, you reach the present, and we know what we have to do in order to reach it. So all the planning today has to start from the future, from a common vision of all the people. Really, it requires a paradigm shift. Most people are afraid of changes. My area of research is risk management. People are risk averse. They, are, they don't like to be exposed to risks. So when they th hear about a paradigm shift, which includes thousands of changes, they start shivering and they don't want to do anything. Actually, we see that to make a paradigm shift is easy. What you have to do is you have to change your glasses. Those people that got my, my business card have a, a riddle on the other side, which is, a paradigm shift. So those of you that like to see it, come and see. Um, the paradigm shift is like this. In the industrial era, we served only economic motives. However, today, we don't have to serve the economy. The economy. We have to serve, the economy has to serve our values. And our values are much larger. They include economics. But this is part of them. And in short, we call it ESSEC, which is the initials, the acronym of economics, the society, the environment, and in general, consciousness. So today I would like to talk a little bit about consciousness. One thing is for sure, and this is another strong tie that I have with Rio, one thing for sure is that the process will cost trillions of dollars per year to change, to make this paradigm shift happen. So the first thing that bothered me, bothered my mind already for more than 15 years, was how to get trillions of dollars. Most people are thinking in terms, decision makers are thinking in terms of hundreds of millions of dollars or a billion or a few billion dollars, but they hardly ever think about trillions. Trillions is a thousand times larger than a billion. So it means that we have to do a thousand times more projects and larger projects 
And this is a major, major issue. In Rio Plus 20, in June 2012, I was here in beautiful Rio, not for the first time. And uh, as part of the Israeli mission to the UN summit on environment and climate change. Not coincidentally, at the same week, in another corner of Rio, actually close to here than to the other meeting, uh, we convened the Global Insurance Forum convened here. The Global Insurance Forum is the forum of all the leading insurance companies, pension plans, retirement programs, etc., and also those that cover also all kinds of uh, property risk, etc. And at that particular meeting, it was a climax of a process that we started about uh, around 2005 to come up with a treaty among all the insurance in the companies in the world because they have the financing. All, you have to understand one thing, the long-term savings in the world, the only source for them are the savings that we or our employers or uh, the government or social security systems are collecting money and they have to invest it in order to pay our retirement after, 20, after 70 years, after 50 years, whatever. So these monies have to be invested for very long term and they have to bring very large yield in order to do that. So I have a solution, I invented some solutions, how we can use these monies. Just the private industry in the world has, is managing for us about $80 trillion, so quite a lot of money. So it could be channeled to projects that can bring the paradigm shift. So these are the pictures from that meeting we drafted. That was a signatory ceremony for the PSI, Principle for Sustainable Insurance Treaty. At that time, about a quarter of the world money signed to it. By now, 50%. The Americans are not in, most of the American companies are not in it yet. So this is the process, so you have some pictures. The quadruple system that we suggested many years ago, the ESSEC, um, had been replaced meanwhile by a very important agreement, international agreement, the Paris Treaty, the Paris Convention at, in December 2015. And as a result of that, all countries in the world, no exception, there, was a, there were two exceptions, but they signed later, all countries in the world signed to the treaty and committed to reach certain goals by 2030. The goals are, are called the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. I was surprised that uh, yesterday coming here, only Professor Saadia and I, myself had the, uh, the, the symbol of the SDGs. Because, and I talked with people and they say, what is it? They'd never heard about the SDGs. And also I noticed, five minutes, my God. The, so I noticed uh, that people took photographs when uh, the two uh, SDG, the SDG4 education was presented. SDG 4 talks about uh, education. We suggest two educational efforts that are excluded yet and not, not included in the SDG 4. And they should be done. These are the SDGs. SDG 4 is on education. And there are all kinds of obstacles. One is short-termism. Decision makers usually have very short term. I'm also chairing the Society for the Visually Impaired People and uh, so I look at many things as an optical issue, and uh, so they are nerve-sighted and short-sighted. Usually, they serve their, you know, their term, and they, this is the, the goals for 2030 for most people is beyond, beyond what they are. They are looking for a real project that they can cut the ribbon when they, and they participate in it. 
and 2030 is too far. A second issue there that prevents, a prob that prevents us from reaching goals are externalities. Because many of the goals, many of the SDGs are really things that the investors that work on them are not being compensated for. For example, if I uh, build a power plant that uh, is using uh, solar uh, panels, the only revenue that I get is by selling electricity. But uh, I'm not compensated for other things that if a government, let's say, would have done it for a minute, uh, would have done that project. The government, first of all, is tax exempt. Secondly, it sees benefits in other places in uh, less uh, pollution, less acid drains, hospitalization costs uh, and health costs will redu be reduced, etc., etc. So the yield that such an organization can pay is much higher than what the in private investor is getting. So we have to solve a major issue. But education is also creating a lot of externalities. Most of the problems that were discussed uh, during the day are externalities. The educational system is not getting the benefits that it is creating. And, it is, and the benefits are being expressed in the budgets, in the health budgets, in the water budget, in all kinds of budget, in security budget, in all kinds of things. So we have to solve this uh, issue and we have to recognize these externalities and that they have to be compensated. I'd like to show that fairly small investment, educational expenditures, can lead to very large savings in many areas. And the topic had been discussed by two of my partners here yesterday, by Dr. Leora Weinbach and by Dr. Ernesto Kornman. And we showed that we develop some kind of an application that is making some miracles and can do all these things that are written here. They can increase the trust among people. It can reduce substantially the internal security budget. It can reduce also health budget. It can reduce the external security budget sometimes, etc. And so the question is how to do that. There are two ways that I think, we think, that can be done. One way is a bottom-up approach, to go to the masses of the people and do things. We started from our speaking abilities. What distinguishes human beings from the rest of the animals is the, our ability to speak, and this enables us to cooperate to make plans, to do things together, to build large projects, and uh, to create complex tools, to make intelligent decisions, etc. All these, when all these qualities are coming up and are being expressed and everything is built in, in our brains, in each of us, when we increase these abilities, we get enormous economic uh, benefits out of it. Especially in the last 10 years or so, or 15 years, we see a very quick deterioration of the level of conversation, the level of general discourse. Because I see what my, my grandchildren are doing. They are playing all the time. They don't look in the eyes of each other. They don't listen to the voice of each other. They don't get all the signals that connect between the people. So the conversation becomes very violent and uh, without understanding, no cooperation, etc. So we are having a research and development efforts and created a really a new area in science, I think, which will be called probably eco-linguistic or something, and uh, it will assess people. The choice really here is whether to make 
rash or rational decisions. The communication between us affects our achievements. However, it also indicates the quality and our ability to make rational decisions. My very good friends Kahneman and Tversky, we taught together at the Hebrew U, and as a matter of fact, the, the experiment that caused their, uh, their uh, Nobel Prize was the first study was done, the first questionnaires were done on my class at the Hebrew U, on my students. They show that there are many cases where people are making irrational decisions. And they say that this, this is, and later on, they open really a big area of study of behavioral economies. And they, they say that we operate in two different systems. System fun is fast, automatic, and is unconscious. And system two, what they call, is slow, conscious, and uh, controlled. The speaking ability is activated exactly by the same type of systems. Because we have two parts, or a few areas in the brain that participate, many parts of the brain participate in the process. Some of them are very ancient, that we inherited from the insects, from the animals, or whatever. And some of them are unique for people, which are basically in the, in the frontal part, or in the neocortex, and mainly some of them in the neocortex in the uh, frontal lobe of the neocortex. The ancient parts of the brain are unconscious, instinctive, automatic, and rapid. They are often egotistic, unfriendly, and they invite aggressive responses. And they are indifferent to the others and to the environment. The second part, which is more intelligent, is apparently controlled by the frontal lobe. It is slower reaction, it's reflecting a conscious decision that considers alternatives, typically is friendly, empathic, and cooperative. There is an inner switch, built-in system, a switch, that transfer control, switch control all the time. Dr. Weinbach, my partner, developed a method to teach people how to do, how to activate this switch. And over the last 20 years or more, she was working with people. She developed the method and developed with people with a frontal teaching, like a group of people sat and discussed issues, and she, the technique that she used enabled them to solve the problems, to activate the switch, to keep it open most of the time after a learning process, and they thereby alleviated the ability of people to solve problems in a friendly manner. We decided, and it has been tested on many people, many gurus in different languages, different age groups, from the age of four to the age of 104, different profession, uh, violent people, prisoners, uh, violent husbands, etc., etc., with ama amazing success. And she talk talked about it yesterday. And people learn to gain better control on the hidden switch. And uh, practically, it means that the conscious part takes control over the unconscious part. And it can be developed with repeated uh, training. The question that we had was how to do that for the masses of people, for the seven and a half billion people on Earth, assuming that by doing that, we'll immensely improve all of us. In order to do that on an automatic uh, level, we have to do it, you know, to do it in the frontal uh, conversation type of way. It's, it will require millions of teachers. It will take us 20 years to develop those teach teachers and mentors. So it's impossible. So we decided to, to do it through the telephone with an application but in order to do it, so it will be a self-learning process, a biofeedback process that uh, can easily be done. You can teach uh, a five, my, I taught my, my youngest uh, grandchildren uh, this thing in five, five minutes.
how to do this. And uh, it can be done. And, uh, but the question is how we can give the person the evaluation of the, of the way he proceeds. Okay, so then Dr. Coleman helped us to develop the, the mechanism to do that. And we do it through the analysis of the sound that we are making. And he explained yesterday in great details what we do. By the way, the, most of the programming is being done by our colleagues from the Palestinian Authority. So people think that most Israelis are, I don't know, devils or... Uh, what are the expected results? Being able to do that, it will affect the speech as well as the well-being of the people. We control this part, controls also our health. So when the switch is open, we control our health as well and there are all kinds of things. It will lead to a more trusting society, and trust is a very important element. Trust, societies with a good trust among people are by far more successful. And uh, it is essential for the handling of all the other SDGs as well. We think that it will reduce all these uh, internal security, external security, health budgets, etc., etc. So we envisage very large things. So a small investment can lead to substantial effect, and uh, we offer it. We'll be, as I said earlier, we'll distribute the system, the pilot, uh, for free. Each of you will be able to get it uh, in the language, so we'll make a version for Portuguese. It's not a big uh, problem. And uh, those of you that will sign your names, you'll get it when it will be ready. The second problem, I don't have time to talk about it, but I'll just say briefly. The second approach is from top down. A major problem in reaching the SDGs is to get the managers join and do these trillions of dollars projects. And we turn the slogan from billions to trillions by 2020, not by 2030, because you cannot wake up in January 2030 and expect all these big projects be ready by the end of 2030. You have to make a lot of preparation. And we spent already three years while most countries did almost nothing. Some countries did things, but most countries did very small steps. To do things by 2020 means that we have about 800 days, plus or minus, uh, for that. Very short period. It requires a tremendous effort. To have this tremendous effort, we have to get all the people, all the managers together. We have to educate them and train them. They are not mentioned here. But we have to change the curriculum of the business schools. We have to train the active managers. We have to change the accounting techniques because what counts, that was the second title for my lecture, what counts is not always counted. The accounting techniques are measuring only the financial capital. When you, you publish uh, the reports, the, the, the statements of a company, it measures only the financial capital. On the average, all the, the market value of all companies in the, in the, uh, the, trade, uh, in the stock markets are traded at about seven times as much as their accounting value. It means that it doesn't measure the right things. It, it ignores the, the human capital. It ignores the intellectual capital, etc. Okay? I'm finishing uh, here. So we need really the support of the accounting firms because they are the major consultants. They have to change the rules. They spent so much time in recent years on regulations and all, all kinds of uh, things. Uh, IFRS, uh, Basel II, Basel this, all these, these things. They spent so much time on petty things 
and they ignore the most important things that they bias all, all of the, the things. I develop on another effort. We join forces with some people, the, the elders of the mentoring business, of the coaching business in the world, and we design a program that all of us can teach uh, all around the world in different languages. We establish an unofficial organization that we called it United Humanity. And, uh, and we have a program that is called Transform Nation, TFN. These are laboratories. We don't lead to this particular results. The participants, the top management of firms, the government, they just sit together, they agree on the vision, they look at the various points of view, and they take decisions. And they come with the new strategic plans, with breakthroughs, no exception. We have seen it many times. However, it's a very slow process. So to finish, I'd like just to give you a magic number before we say thank you. The magic number is the email and the phone number. So write those down if you like. We establish a company which is called Unitalk. It doesn't have yet an internet site because we were under the radar. And the, it is not for profit. The things we shall contribute it, it is for benefit. We shall uh, contribute uh, this to all the nations. Any country that likes to, to do that, any municipality that likes to do it in its community, any com community that likes to try it, you'll get it for free, you'll have an access to it. You people will be the first, those that will sign your, their emails, you'll be the first to get it. So thank you very, very much.